Welcome to Blagdon Lake. My name's John Horsey. I'm a professional fly fishing guide based primarily at Chew and Blagdon Lakes. Today we're going to be fishing out on Blagdon Lake. Normally I'd be taking one or two clients out or maybe more. One of the things that's very important when you go boat fishing is to make sure you're comfortable and to make sure the boat is well set out. As you can see, I've got my rod stowed safely, my bags close to hand, my coat's in the boat, even though it's a nice sunny day today. You never know when you're going to get a storm. Another thing that I recommend to use is a pair of inflatable braces or an inflatable waistcoat. Both of these can be very good if you happen to have lumpy weather. Comfort is also very important. I always use a tight line swivel seat when I'm boat fishing and I also provide them for all my clients. We find that the back support is really important, especially if you have a bad back. Sitting in a boat all day can be most uncomfortable. It also helps you to be kept up off the seat a little bit so that you can actually stretch your legs and bend your legs a bit, which is something else that's important. On very cold, windy days, the back of the seat actually stops the wind from getting you right in the small of the back, and that can also be uncomfortable. So once you've got the boat laid out nice and tidily, and you've got some comfort, you're safe, you need some way of getting across the lake. Blagdon boats are rowing boats, but we actually can use electric engines here. So we've got electric engines set up, and we're all ready to go across to Buckham Bay to do a little bit of lock-style drift fishing. What I need to do, first of all, is get the oar out and just push us away from the landing stage. Okay, I've just come across to Buckham Bay. I've actually seen that they're actually stocking some fish at the moment. So I thought what we do is just nip out of the boat, if I can get out without falling in, and uh, just have a chat to Paul, who's stocking the fish, and just uh, see what's going on. Some good sized stockfish going into the lake. Bristol Water Company are justifiably proud of their stockfish. They're usually full-finned and full-tailed, good condition fish. And what they tend to do is to not put all the fish into one area, but to put a few here and a few there. They've also got some stocking boats on chew that they take out into the lake itself and spread the stockfish around evenly all over the lake. On such a hot day such as this, the fish sometimes struggle to get out of the shallow water. So I expect Paul will be helping them out in a minute, just pushing them on their way a little bit. I'd say the average weight of these fish are, what, a pound and a half, Paul? Yeah. About a pound and a half. Some are about a pound and three quarters, two pounds. It's not an exact science, but I'd say the minimum weight is about a pound and a half. They're brought over to the lake in oxygenated tanks. And then they're put into the lake either by reversing the Land Rover right down into the water and tipping all the fish out in one. Or in shallow areas like this, they've got to be physically taken out in nets and dropped into the water. It's something that a lot of people never actually see. All of these fish have actually been reared at Ubley Hatchery and we'll be having a look at Ubley a little bit later on. But I think what we'll do now is we'll leave these fish to acclimatise, we'll get back into the boat and we'll go to a completely different part of the lake and we'll do a little bit of fishing. Let these get back into the wild again. Well, we've left Buckham Bay and we've travelled halfway up the lake to just off a of Rainbow Point and we're drifting from Rainbow Point across Holt Bay onto Green Lawns, which is ahead of us. What I'm trying to do here is drift but pull a team of flies. With modern lock-style drifting, 
You can either fish a team of dry flies on a floating line, or you can pull a team of nymphs on a floating line, or you can actually pull a team of lures on a floating line. If you don't want to fish a floater, or you feel the fish are a bit deeper, then you can go to subsurface lines like an intermediate, or a slow sink, or in extremes, you fish a really fast DI6 sinking line, which really can get you down very quickly. The main benefits of drifting, as opposed to anchoring, is that you cover so much more water. When you set the anchor, when you're fishing in a bay like this and you just set an anchor, you'd be in one position, and one position only, and you would cover just a small area of water and you'd be reliant on the fish actually coming to you, rather than covering the water and, and drifting over fish. So any new pockets of fish, if you're fishing at anchor, you would never cover. So what we tend to do nowadays is always drift fish. Sometimes using a drogue, sometimes without a drogue, depending on the speed of the wind, the strength of the wind. But at the moment, what I'm trying to do is explore this little bit of area here. If you look across the bay, there's quite a bit of dirty water, and it's been stirred up by the wave action off of Rainbow Point itself. So I'm fishing the clean water just inside of the dirty water there. I know there's some fish just off this point here. And I'm just trying to find a way using a damsel-type nymph on the point and a little attractor peach doll in the middle and a small palmer on the top dropper. I'm just trying to find a way that I can get one or two of these fish to take. What we try to do fishing on the drift like this is actually drift down through these wind lanes. You can see this small wind and scum lanes. And you normally find that the stronger the wind, the less likely you have of getting wind lanes, but you get an awful lot of scum lanes. And the scum lanes are formed by waves actually breaking on it themselves and creating a couple of bubbles. And then these bubbles actually start to group together like this in little lines. And the fish will swim up and down these lines of scum. So it's always the best place to fish is along the scum lanes. The one thing that's very difficult to tell on a bright, breezy day like this is how deep the fish are going to be. So sometimes I'm pulling my flies back straight away nice and quickly. Other times I'm just fishing them as a figure of eight retrieve, just like I'm doing now. Just keeping in touch with the line. Swinging out to the corner of the boat. I think they're going to need a little bit of coaxing today. There's a general rule of thumb, really, when fishing on days like this. I would say that the bigger the wave, the stronger the wind, the bigger the fly you actually use. If you've got a fairly calm day, or even a flat calm day, you go much, much smaller in fly size. The fish has also got an awful lot more time in calm conditions to actually be able to inspect the fly. There's a fish move right in front of the boat there. You often say where there's one fish, there's another, so... I'm fishing down through the same line that that fish came up in there. Once again, they're actually moved in this scum line here. So at the end of each retrieve, rather than just lift the flies straight off the water and recast, I always just hold the flies there just for a split second or so in case there's a following fish that wants to make its mind up to actually take the fly. If you pull it straight out the water, it'll just swirl and there'll be nothing there. If you just hang it there just for a second, even on a floating line, then it's got an opportunity to make its mind up and actually take the fly. The line profile I'm using here as well as a weight forward line. Weight forwards are far easier to cast than double tapers and the presentation is every bit as good. I'm a great believer in doing things and making things nice and simple. And using a weight forward line certainly is a much simpler way of casting a line and covering fish. I saw another fish move there, down the wind, about 45 yards, slightly off to the side of the boat. And another fish can fly on out the water down there. There's certainly over some fish. <laughs> I'm down if I can get one to take at the moment.
what I'm doing at the moment is I'm actually fishing it right up through the middle of this little scum lane here. And I'm fishing a little bit faster than the speed of the drift of the boat. A lot of people have difficulty trying to decide when they come out onto a day boat fishing like this, whether they should start with dry flies or pulling flies, whether they should start on a floating line or on a sinking line or an intermediate line. There's no real hard and fast rule, but on sunny, bright days like this, it's less likely for a fish to actually stick its head out of the water and stick its snout out of the water to take a dry fly. So we tend to fish just slightly subsurface because I don't think the fish are particularly deep. I think maybe they're two or three feet deep at the most. There's nothing really to drive them very deep in the water and it's, it's a popular misconception that whenever it's bright, the fish automatically go to the bottom. There's no reason why they should go to the bottom. A couple of feet down, they're out of the rays of the sun. They've got no eyelids, so they must find it very uncomfortable being in the top few inches of the water on a bright, windy day like this. But having already seen two or three fish move just on this drift alone, they obviously aren't very deep. What we're really trying to do, and this is the crux of the matter, is we're trying to make a fish take the fly that doesn't really want to take it. That's the whole essence of what we're trying to do now. So rather than fish something really imitative, like a dry fly right in the surface, we're actually trying to pull something past it, which is not so much gaudy, but something that's going to aggravate it, maybe just to get its aggressive instincts going. Well, I fish those wind lanes and scum lanes through pretty hard, and they prove totally unproductive. So what I think we'll do is we'll try a different method. The fish are obviously in those lanes, but I think they're probably a foot or two down. The fish in a floating line with a lightly leaded point fly meant that the fly was skipping along just subsurface. What I think we'll do is we'll move over to some sinking lines and we'll try the flies just two or three feet down or maybe even more. First of all, I take my glasses off. I find that when you're boat fishing, sunglasses are absolutely vital. These are ocean wave sunglasses. They're very well polarized and they've also got little side pieces on them as well that not only helps to stop the light from coming in through the sides as you're looking into the water, but also it stops any hooks from being deflected into your eyes, so they are a really important piece of equipment. And a hat, good peaked hat is another good piece of equipment. Not only does it stop flying hooks again from coming into your face, but also if you're trying to look at dry flies on the surface, you get a lot of glare coming straight at you, and the peak of the hat actually stops the sun from hitting you in the eyes, so. Let's move somewhere else now and see if we can pick up a few fish on sinking line methods. Well, I've just put the anchor down. Having been in quite wild water for a lot of the morning, it's obvious that the fish aren't really responding to lock-style drifting tactics. So I thought I'd come around into a bay here, which is just on the mouth of Buckham Bay, and just do a little bit of quiet anchoring and see if we can actually catch a few fish on subsurface line techniques. Um, what I thought I'd do first of all is just go through a few items of boat tackle that I use. Uh, the first thing, really, is to always make sure you've got your landing net set up before you start fishing. Because the worst thing to do is to start fishing, have a cast, hook a fish, and have no landing net ready. The net I use is one like this, which is an extending landing net. And it's got a nice big round net, it's quite light, and it actually collapses down very easily. My rod is a 10-foot rod. I always use 10 foot from the boat. Maybe when I'm bank fishing, I use 9 foot or 9 foot 6. But boat fishing, I always use a 10 foot rod. This is a new Witchwood 10 foot all rounder rod, which I helped design in the winter. And I'm very pleased with it. It's a three piece construction and uh, it's very light. It very bends really well. And you can feel your fighting fish right down to the butt here. But it's also stiff enough to put a good 25, 30 yards of line out, which is what you need but also soft enough to absorb the takes and actually set the hook. Reels, I think, are quite important. Years ago, I used to say that reels were just a method of storing line, but nowadays, reels with a good disc drag on them are really vitally important. And when you get fish that are running 
taking a full fly line out, plus 40, 50 yards of back in, a good disc drag will really help you play that fish out. One other thing that I use quite a lot, especially when fishing sinking lines, is this little gizmo. It's a fish finder. What it actually is is an echo sounder, and it sends out sonar pulses every second. And sonar pulses are actually reflected back from objects such as fish in the bottom and such like, and they're actually showing up on a screen. So if I turn this on a second, this should give me an accurate readout of the depth we're over. Normally I use my rod to just probe into the water, put my rod in like this to find out how deep we are. When you've got a few hundred pounds worth of rod, it's quite an expensive operation if you get it stuck in the bottom. So at the moment it's telling me we're over about five or six feet of water, just, just around about six feet of water. So although I use a fish finder a lot, I don't actually rely on it to catch fish. What I rely on it for is to find the contours and the drop-offs so I can find the interesting parts of the lake to fish. So now that we know our depth, and now that we've got our bits and pieces of tackle together, let's have a bit of fishing, I think, with uh, what I'm going to use is a, an airflow fast glass intermediate line. Right. Although I far prefer fishing from the drift, mainly because you cover more fish and more water, there are times such as days like this when you do need to control your flies a lot better. And when you're fishing fairly deep water, or you want your flies to get down a few feet, it's much easier to set the anchor so you can let your flies sink. And you don't need to use too fast a sinking line. You just rely on waiting a little bit longer to get those flies down and get your fly line down. So let's cast this lot out, pay a bit more line off the reel for a longer cast next time, give it a pull to sink it all, and straighten it all up. What I'll do now is I'll just figure of eight very slowly, and I'm just keeping in touch with the line really slowly as the fly line sinks through the water. So any takes I might get on the drop now, I'll feel. In the meantime, I'll put my glasses back on, It takes the glare off the water when you're staring into the water like this. And it also helps protect your eyes from any flying hooks. So while I'm waiting for this to sink, and that's about as far as I'm going to let it sink at the moment, start to bring it back and vary my retrieve rates. I'll go over something that people ask me more than anything else, really, and that's leader construction. First of all, uh, the leader materials I use are always the low diameter style leader materials. Um, I think over the course of a season, you'll get far more takes using low diameter leader materials than you will using the old thick monos. The only thing is you have to be a bit careful and you have to balance your tackle to handle it, really. One of the things I wouldn't do, and I wouldn't dream on a reservoir like this where the average size fish is over two pounds, I wouldn't dream of using less than six pound double strength. Normally I use, I use uh, 7 pounds, 8 pounds, 8.5, sometimes even 9.5. So if you're fishing quite deep, it's less likely that your, the thickness of the, the leader is going to make a lot of difference. I'm just letting this go down again. My usual leader construction, as far as length is concerned and droppers, is that I have 5 feet between the point fly and the middle dropper further five feet from the middle dropper to the top dropper, then only three feet to the braided leader. Now I class a braided leader as just an extension to my fly line. Well, that's a bit of weed, that's a bit exciting for a second. And what I do is I match up sinking braided leaders, I match up the sink rate of a sinking braided leader to the sink rate of the fly line itself. So with something like this fast glass, it's actually a very slow sinker. So I, I use a slow sink braided leader to go with it. Sometimes I might use a fast sink just to chop and change it a little bit. And just alter the way that the fly line goes down and the flies go down. But I reckon then I was about five to six feet deep and I just hit on a stone or a little bit of muck on the bottom. And that's what that little tug was. But one of the other things about my leader construction is that I never actually break the length of leader material at all. I take off 13 feet of straight leader material and then I break off two one foot lengths of leader and I use those as my droppers. 
and I use a three-turn water knot to actually attach those onto my leader. So I have long droppers and uh, three-turn water knot. With the low diameters, you cannot use strangulation knots like the blood knot. It's a good dropper knot because it helps to the uh, dropper to hang away perpendicular to the leader. But the only problem is double strengths and low diameter monos, just low diameter copolyamides, they just will not handle strangulation knots. There we are. Bit of a knot in that. Let's give that another cast. Try a different angle, I think. Something I like to do when I'm fishing, whether I'm fishing sinking lines, whether I'm fishing floating lines and pools, nymphs, or floating lines and dries, is always fish the angles to the sides of the boats. If you just fish down the middle of the boat all the time, you're just giving the flies a single profile to the fish, a straight on profile. If you fish to the edges of the boat and to the sides of the boat, you give it a sideways on profile and it sees a lot more of the fly. I like fishing this bay here just off the corner of the North Shore Point because normally the wind blows in the southwesterly direction here, and that's the prevailing wind, and that would actually be coming straight in at us now. And this morning it changed, and normally when the wind changes like this, it does throw the fish off the feed. But what it normally does do is that there's a lot of Daphnia in Blagdon Lake, so the Daphnia will be blown onto the lee shore, and the fish should still be here having a look around for the Daphnia. So while I've got on the cast, I'm using this fast class intermediate line to get down a bit, but I've got a, a Viva lure on the point, and I've got a pheasant tail nymph on the middle dropper and a hare's ear nymph on the top dropper. So if I just bring this through, fish this cast out. It's a horrible backwind there, just blew the line down. I'll just leave that a second. I'll just go over, take my glasses off. Some of the flies that I use. Whenever I'm fishing a sinking line, I don't really like using three lures. Sometimes I use three lures, sometimes two, but whenever I'm using a sinking line, I've normally got one marabou lure on. And this is my lure box. This is my box of nasties. So in here, as you can see, there's various vivas, there's various doubles, there's orange lures, peach dolls, green dolls, pink nasties, lots of white lures as well for fry feeding time, a few boobies, lots of muddlers. These are all lures and attractors. These are all things designed to get the aggressive instincts of the trout going. So when the fish don't really want to feed, such as now, or if they're on tiny little microscopic water fleas like Daphnia, it's no good fishing a very small fly. You want to give it a decent mouthful, something it's going to see, something that's going to stand out. Uh, this water, the water clarity here at the moment is about two to three feet, which is fairly good, but in excellent conditions you're probably talking six or seven foot clarity. So if you've got pretty poor clarity, funnily enough a black fly stands out as well as anything, and really a viva like that. Good old simple pattern, green tag, a combination of green and black is a killer, and it's a killer on almost any lake I've ever fished, and that includes places around the world like New Zealand and Italy caught lots of wild brown trout and wild rainbows in New Zealand on vivas, so we know they work all over. You can add a few things to them like this. That's a double, but that's got a bit of jungle cock in it. And jungle cock seems to really glow as it comes through the water, and you can pick that jungle cock up as you're bringing the flies through. This is my box of nymphs. There used to be an awful lot more nymphs in here than there are at the moment, but uh, buzzers and stick flies and pheasant tails and deal bass, all these sort of flies. Normally you fish with a floating line. Nowadays if I'm fishing floating line for uh, floating line tactics with nymphs, I tend to discard the nymphs altogether and fish dries. When I tend to use nymphs a lot nowadays is on sinking lines. So um, these sort of patterns, let me see, good old pheasant tail and buzzers, red buzzers, bright orange buzzers, sedge pupae, all these things will catch fish at Blagdon Lake and on almost any other lake. The best nymphs, I think, in my opinion, are not the ones that are real perfect representations of buzzers or nymphs. 
their general caricatures, their suggestive patterns, like a green tag stick. That really is one of the best buzzer patterns you can get. Pheasant tails, they're another good general pattern. And deal bark, another good general pattern. My buzzers, I used to fish lots of very slim buzzers, which looked really natural. And then I was outfished so many times by people using rough, shaggy old sealsfer patterns that most of my uh, buzzer patterns are all sealsfer nowadays. So that's my nymph box. A few floating fry in there just hanging around, just in case a few fish pop up and have a look around. I'll put those back in my pocket. I think the problem we've got though here at the moment is that it's still bright, it's still windy, there's some white horses out in the middle of the lake there. We fished this little area for a while, we've tried to explore the depths to see if we can get anything on nymphs, to see if we can get anything on the lure. But what I think we'll do now is we'll go onto the lee shore, we'll fish across the middle of the deep water, I'll put on a really fast sinking DI6 line and uh, a team of a couple of lures and one nymph and then we'll do some drifting across onto the lee shore, we'll use a drogue as well and we'll fish on the hang too to see if we can get some fish like that. Here we are back at Blagden again today. Yesterday was absolutely dire. We had what I think is the worst conditions possible for fly fishing. Very, very bright skies and a really brisk wind. The wind at times got up to 20, 25 miles an hour yesterday. I know for a fact that only one trout was caught on the reservoir from every boat that was out. I actually caught a small perch later in the afternoon, so I counted that as a moral victory. But today we're out, we're trying the corner of the dam. We're using fast sinking DI6 lines to try and get down just a little bit deeper Drifting with a drogue to slow the boat down. Just trying to winkle one or two fish out. It's important when you're fishing fast sinking lines from the drift to be able to cast a good long line because a lot of the time, once you've cast, as I'm doing now, I'm just figure of eighting to take up the slack. That's while the boat actually drifts on to where your flies are. So you might even retrieve as much as a third to a half of your fully cast line before you start retrieving the flies again. So I'm letting the flies get down to about five, six, seven feet and then pulling and a couple of slow retrieves, keeping varying the retrieve all the time. But there's one really critical thing about fishing a fast sinking line and that's fishing the hang. I'm getting to the stage now where I'm coming to the end of the retrieve. Instead of just whipping the flies off the water, I just lift them through once, second fly, point fly, there's nothing following, so up and recast. I really can't bring home enough the importance of fishing the hang at the end of every single retrieve. It's the one time when you forget and you just lift your flies off to cast, there's a big swirl, the fish is followed up, your chance is gone. The boat's actually yawing on the drogue here. We're pushing across like that. So that's why my line is swinging to the side of the boat. So I just keep in touch all the time, always with a straight line, so you're always in touch. Lift the flies. Nothing there. We've got some lovely scum lanes here as well. I'm hoping we'll actually get some fish up on the dries a little bit later, but at the moment, there's no sign of moving fish. We've seen a fish or two caught around us, and that's on sinking line tactics. So I'm quite sure we're doing the right thing at the moment. Just as it's coming to the edge of the boat, I'll give it a few sharp pulls, stop it, hang the flies. What I tend to do when I'm fishing a sinking line is actually try and imagine in my mind's eye that there's a fish following the fly. And I try to think of something I could do to turn that following fish into a taking fish. And that's 
hence the retrieve where you pull a couple of times quickly and then slow it down and maybe lift the rod a little bit just to try and get those flies to sweep up and down. Anything that might turn that following fish into a taking fish. Another very important thing to do, and it's a clever tip really, is to always have your brightest coloured fly on the top dropper. When you're fishing a sinker, it's the opposite to what you would do fishing a floater. Your top dropper gets down first to the business area, but it's also the fly that comes up first, so you can see it. And when you're fishing the hang, that's the fly you look at to see if there's anything happening, anything following. So I'm just bringing my fill. Flies up through, fishing the hang. Bring it up through. There's my top dropper. Yes! Oh! It's gone deep. See if I can get his head up. Yeah. There it is. Try and get it in the net. You can see the orange law in its mouth. Ah, that's better. Oh. Well, that's a nice little blagden stockfish. What I think I'll do is I'll spoon it to actually find out what it's been feeding on, see if we've been using the right methods. There we are, that's what it's been feeding on. Tiny little water fleas, they're known as Daphnia. And these hang around in clouds of millions and the fish actually swim through them with their mouths open, just sucking in all these tiny little invertebrates. Having seen this, I'll get rid of that. We'll actually go up to Ubley Hatchery now, and uh, I promised earlier on I'd take you up and show you how the fish are reared there, so we'll go through and have a look, see what happens in Ubley. Bristol Water Company are justifiably proud of the condition of their stockfish. They're all reared here at the Ubley Hatchery. It's a fascinating place here at Ubley. The, uh, the whole basis of the hatchery process is actually diverting the River Yeo around the hatchery. What happens is at the end of each fishing season, the brown and rainbow trout still have spawning urges, and they run up the feeder stream here, out of Blagden Lake, into the River Yeo. The River Yeo is very cleverly being diverted around the hatchery, and the fish then have to go through a number of fish passes and holding pools before they get to the final horseshoe pond. Once they get there, they can't get out again, and the fish are taken out by nets and by rangers here where they're stripped of their eggs and milt, and the fertilised eggs actually go into the hatchery uh, building. Once they hatch out into tiny fry, they go through different stages of their life, and they're actually put into holding ponds and uh, stew ponds like that behind me here. After several months and sometimes a couple of years, they're released into the lake, and the whole, whole process goes on again. The weather conditions are absolutely ideal now. We've got overcast skies, a light breeze, and lovely warm air temperatures. So let's get back afloat on the Blagden, set up the dry fly rods, and go catch a few fish on dries. Well, we've just come from Ubley Hatchery, where the weather conditions were absolutely perfect for dry fly fishing. It was overcast, there was a nice light breeze and very warm. And you can see now we're only half a mile away from Ubley Hatchery and we've got a fair bit of cloud still in the sky but there's an awful lot of sun as well. So these aren't perfect conditions for fishing drives but still we're going to fish them and go through the methods and tactics we normally use. Rods, exactly the same as for pulling fly techniques. Ten foot, stuck in my shirt. Three piece construction again. Number seven weight forward floating line. Team of three dry flies. The cast is exactly the same. Five foot between the point fly and the middle dropper. Five foot between the middle dropper and the top dropper and three foot to the floating braided leader. I use a three foot length of floating braided leader mainly to help turn over the flies but also to give a bit of shock absorption on uh, smash takes and also when I strike to set the hook. Just put my glasses back on. The glasses and hat 
a really important when fishing dries because you want to concentrate as much as possible on the dry fly so you can actually see the tape. And the good peaked hat and the good pair of sunglasses really helps to concentrate on the flies. All we're going to do is fish a short line of about 5 to 10 yards in a light ripple like this with no fish moving. We're trying to bring the fish up. So what I do is I cast 5 to 10 yards, short line, let the flies hit the water. If the fish are going to come and take the fly, they'll be up and take it within one or two seconds of the flies hitting the water. So if I don't get a take within five to ten seconds maximum, I lift the flies up and drop them somewhere else. No false casting, just up and down. So in the course of about a minute, I've already cast about five times, maybe six times. I've covered a large area of water in front and to the side of the boat. And we call it fan casting. So you're fan casting to cover a good area. The main reason for this, I think, and also the main reason that dry flies are so effective nowadays, is that the fish, the eyes on a fish are set towards the top of their head. So they're always looking up for food. So the place where they're expecting their food to be, most of all, is on or near the surface. So by dropping a team of dries constantly on the surface, lovely fish just moves out there. Absolute cracking fish. Great big dorsal fin. This is when a short line isn't necessary, putting the long line over the fish. Any fish you see move, you must cover it. That was a beautiful big fish. If I got the cast right, I would have, would have expected a take by now, so I don't think I've got it quite right. So I'm going to push it down somewhere else. It's the biggest fish I've seen move on Blagden for a while. what makes it really exciting. The great thing about fishing dry flies is when you actually cover the fish and you see it come up and just take the fly and you've got a strike to set the hook. I think it's about the most exciting sight in fly fishing. I still haven't given up on that fish. I'm trying to put the flies in any position that the fish might still be in. A lot of people when they see a fish move, they cast at it once, don't get a take and give up on it. I'm beginning to have serious doubts whether I'm actually going to catch that fish now. But it was great to see a moving fish like that. It really does give you heart. I've just seen another fish jump clear out of the water further ahead of us. Certainly quite a few fish up here. We're actually up the top end. This is my favourite part of Blagden. So having just said I'm going to fish a short line, this is the unpredictability of fishing really. A fish moves and you must cover it even if you just cast the longest cast you've ever made in your life and the fish moves five yards from the boat, strip it all in, cover that fish. Because that might be the only one moving, feeding fish you see all day. So what I'm going to do now is keep my eyes peeled so I'm watching as much of the water as I can, but I'm still trying to home in on the top dropper, which is my carrot fly. So I look away, I look for signs of moving fish. If I don't see anything, back to short line, short line casting, fan casting. That fish only moved the once. Now when fish are moving like that, we call them onces. What we really want is fish that move across and across and across and move up the wind. Because then you know what direction they're moving in, how you've got to cover them, how much lead to give them. In these conditions, when they're moving just the once, you've got just as much chance as they're going to come and take your artificial dry as if they're going to take a natural. So it really has fired me with enthusiasm, that's bit. All I'm doing on the retrieve is just not moving the flies at all. All I'm doing is keeping up with the speed of the drift of the boat, taking up the slack. Yes! What a lovely take that was. God, it didn't take him long to get round the side. What a cracking take. His mouth came right out over the fly and took it. What a lovely take. I don't know if it's that big one I saw earlier. Oh, he's a strong fish. Oh, 
Ah, it's on the top dropper. It's on the carrot fly. It's got me in a hell of a mess. See if I can coax him in. Yeah, his head's up. See if I can bring him straight to the net. Ah, that's it. Oh, that's better. Brilliant. There. Fish in the net. Carrot fly in the mouth. Oh, let's take this hook out. Look at the carrot fly right in the scissors. Oh, look at that. I can see already what the fish has been feeding on. There's Daphne actually in its mouth there. What I'll do is I'll, I'll give it a spoon, as I usually do. This marrow spoon gets an awful lot of abuse. Just pop it in, twist it around, pull it back out again. Yeah, not that much Daphnia, nothing but Daphnia in it, but certainly Daphnia. And really, that would mean that they're normally feeding subsurface, but that fish actually came up because trout are really opportunistic feeders. If there's a bit of food in front of it and they're feeding, they quite often come up and take it. And the dry fly, by just dropping it around, as we said earlier, putting it in the right place at the right time, it suddenly fell right in a trout's window and it came there within seconds of the fly landed on the water. So it took that uh, dry carrot fly, even though it had been feeding subsurface on Daphnia. Let's just get rid of that. Up my hands, put the spoon back in my bag. Dry my hands off. Right, this is my box of dry flies. You can see that most of the colours are reds, clarets, orange, ginger, fiery brown. There's a few blacks in there as well, but mainly reds, oranges and clarets. And those are the colours that I find work best on all the large still waters in this country. Early season and late season, black seems to work well. But one colour that I can't seem to catch very many fish on is green. And it's very strange that most of the spoonings inside of fish have something green in them. Yet reds and clarets are much better for catching those fish. The flies that I actually had on that cast then were an orange carrot fly, a red bob's bits, and a claret hopper. And normally, I would say the golden rule is the bigger the wave, the bigger the fly. The smaller the wave or a flat calm, you go down to 14s, maybe even 16s sometimes, but quite small. But on here, because we've had a, such a rough day and strange weather conditions, I've had a nice big carrot fly on the top dropper, a size 14 red bits in the middle, and quite a big hopper on the point. But the hopper is quite dull compared with the other two, so I'm tr trying really to cover all eventualities. The other thing is, by using three flies, you've got three chances when you're covering moving fish. That big fish I covered earlier, if I only had one fly on, I would have one chance of catching that fish. If the fish moved off in a different direction than I thought it was moving in, and I only cast one fly at it, I'd have no chance of catching that fish. But with two or three flies, even if the cast goes across the fish, there's a good chance it might pick up the fly. Right, let's just put these flies back in the box. And then one important thing we must do, there's been quite a bit of slime over that fly, and a lot of water and the other flies while the fish was fighting so we'll put some gink onto the flies some fly floatant let's just put a little bit of gink on my finger there we are blow on it rub it with my thumb and dab the fly and that's done what we also need to do is put some leader sink on the leader and that's done by just getting some fuller's earth and washing up liquid mixture on your finger like this and just literally rub it down through your leader. Put it on all the leader, right down to the fly, all the droppers. Don't worry if you get some on the fly because the gink is so good. It will help the fly to float anyway. There we are. That's all done. So all we need to do now, clean the muck off your finger, go out, try and catch another fish on dries, but because they were feeding on Daphnia, and because there's quite a bit of sun around as well, we might need to go to an intermediate. But to start off with, let's go and have another go with dries. Right, since I caught that fish on the dries, I've not moved another one. It's got very bright 
and I really do think that I need to go to an intermediate. So if I wind this in, put the flies up. Change over to my intermediate line. An intermediate line is a really important line. It lets you get down either a few inches or maybe a couple of feet, depending on how slow the drift of the boat or how slow your retrieve rate is. But it cuts through that surface film and gets your flies down to the feed-in fish, hopefully, quite quickly. So what I'm doing is I've got a combination of lures, nymphs and a palmer as well. So I'm trying to hedge my bets with three different types of fly patterns here. Once again, with an intermediate line, I cast a fairly long line, give it a pull to sink it, because it's amazing how tight the surface tension of the water is sometimes, and then just figure of eight it back, and then change the retrieve a little bit. Never keep on with the same retrieve. It really is important to keep on chopping and changing on your retrieves. Just like we did with the sinking line tactics. And don't ever be in too much of a hurry to strip your flies out of the water. Rubbish in the boat. Take that home with me. So figure of eight for a little while, let the flies get down. And fish them back to the boat. Right, let's pull this. Got a little knock then just on the retrieval. Yes, yes, that's right, that's better. And I thought I had a little knock just before then as well. Great lump of weed on the top dropper. I think the fish is probably on the middle. Yeah, it is, it's on the middle dropper. It's on the stick fly. Let's try and keep him down a bit. I'm glad I changed to the intermediate. It's obviously that the line that did the trick. Ah, it's gone in the weed. It's got a great hunk of weed over its head. Whenever do they do that, it stops them straight away. Ah, there we are. Fish, weed and all. All in the landing net, thank goodness. Well, it was a good idea changing to that intermediate line. On tricky days like this, Change to an intermediate often brings good results. We certainly haven't seen the best of Blagden over the last couple of days, but we've caught a few fish and tried lots of different methods. I hope you enjoyed the video. We'll see you in part two. Let it sink a couple of seconds and then quite a Welcome to Blagden Lake, 
the unearthly hour of five o'clock in the morning. My name's John Horsey. I'm a professional guide at True Valley and Blagden Lakes. Normally I would be fishing from a boat with clients, but a lot of the time it is good to get out onto the bank. You can fish the bank at very early in the morning, whereas from the boats you can't usually start till about 10 o'clock. The advantage of starting so early in the morning is that you can take the advantage of the early morning rise. This morning when we came at first light, you could see fish moving all across the bay here. This is Pegs Bay at Blagden Lake. Across from me we've got Rugmore Point. The sort of areas that we look for from fishing from the bank are points and peninsulas, anywhere that might hold fish, anywhere that you can get out and fish either to the left, downwind or to the right. What I'll be doing today is showing you all the different methods of fishing from the bank, either fishing with a crosswind as we've got at the moment. One of the important things when you're fishing from the bank is to try and fish with a crosswind. You don't really want the wind to be blowing from your back, although it does help casting. You don't want the wind to be blowing straight in at you because it's difficult to cast and the water gets very dirty. But you want a crosswind from right to left or left to right, just as we've got in this bay because this is perfect. There's been plenty of fish moving. It's quietened down a little bit, but there's still the odd fish moving. So what I think I'll do is I'll just come ashore and go through the normal setup for fishing from the bank. The main thing about bank fishing is travelling light. We just go through what I use for bank fishing. I like to have everything on me, so I wear a waistcoat and all my fly boxes, all my bits and pieces, my priest, all my leader material are all in the pockets of my waistcoat. Um, obviously you need a pair of waders. These are neoprene waders, they're very light and they're very comfortable as well. A hat is very important and sunglasses are very important. So I've got a couple of pairs here. One, these are both ocean waves glasses. These are the kingfish and these aren't mirrored. And these are the Catalina and these are mirrored. So the mirrored ones are supposed to cut out more glare, and I think they probably do, so it's really up to personal choice. So I'll just put these around my neck. It's important to have a lanyard as well. I've lost sunglasses in the past where they've either flipped off of my neck while I've been off my ears while I've been casting, or they've just dropped into the water. So a good lanyard when you're not using your sunglasses because it's quite dark at the moment and I wouldn't bother doing it. You just have them hanging around your neck. So there we are. So into the rod, the main bit of tackle. I normally use a nine foot six rod. You want something rated to cast a seven or eight line really, unless you're gonna be doing shooting head work where you want something for a nine and maybe even a 10. But this is a rod that's rated for seven to eight. Um, the fly line I'm using is a floating fly line and that's weight forward profile. I still always recommend people to use weight forward profile fly lines for both boat and bank fishing. It's far easier to cast a weight forward line than a double taper line, and presentation is every bit as good. The thing is you can cast much further, much more quickly with a weight forward. So, although the floating line is the line that you'll use most of all, it's still important to have a good range of fly lines, so you want an intermediate, a slow sink, and a very fast sink fly line if you want to fish something like boobies on the bottom early season. So that's my fly line, my rod, my reel, not quite so critically important from the bank as it is from the boat, but I still like reels with a good disc drag. So if you have a fish that you hit in shallow water, where we're fishing at the moment, for example, because there's no depth for them to fight in, they'll actually run out. So they'll scream out a whole fly line and some back in very quickly. And the disc drag does help by adjusting that to slow the fish down. So having looked at rod, reel, and fly line, Leader materials, I normally use low diameter leaders. Um, from the bank, I wouldn't dream of using anything less than six pounds uh, breaking strain, maybe seven pounds, maybe 8.5. Um, standard monos are fine as well, but I would like to use something like four or five pounds. In very rough conditions, six pounds standard mono is fine, no problem. Uh, three flies I normally use, and the distance between the flies are normally five foot from the point fly to the middle dropper, another five foot from the middle dropper to the top dropper, and three feet to the butt. Uh, the butt I always term as the butt of the fly line, but I actually always use about three foot of braided leader as well, which I attach directly to the end of my fly line. So if I'm using a sinking fly line, 
I'll use a sinking braided leader and I'll try and get the sink rate to match up to the, uh, the sink rate of the fly line. Uh, one of the things I haven't mentioned which is absolutely critical is a long handled pointed landing net. That's handy both for wading and it, you can use it as a wading staff and also when you're actually out on the water fishing you can use it as a line tray as well. So that's all the things you need really to go bank fishing. The conditions are pretty good so let's go out and catch a few fish. There's been quite a few fish moving this morning, but the sun's just come out and it's made it a little bit brighter, so it'll probably put them down and stop them moving for a little while, mainly because trout don't have any eyelids, so they don't like moving into the ripple in the sun. But the fish have been moving this morning and they've been feeding on buzzers. Buzzers, the technical name of coronamids, they're called buzzers because if one hits you in the ear, you know exactly the distinctive buzzing sound that they make, so they're nicknamed buzzers by anglers. What we tend to do is we, we try to fish three different stages of the metamorphosis of the buzzer. The eggs are laid into the water by females and they just hatch into tiny little larva called bloodworm. And then the larva pupates into a buzzer pupa and that can live anywhere from the bottom up to the surface really until it actually gets to the surface of the water, breaks through the surface and hatches out into an adult buzzer. Now the fish that were feeding on the surface this morning, and still are, are feeding on these buzzers that are actually breaking through the surface film and trying to take off. So what I'm doing is I'm actually fishing a team of dry flies. And I'm casting, trying to cast a moving fish, that's the most important thing. And at the moment the fish has just moved out there. Yes! Brilliant! That took a treat. Whoa, stay down. That came up and sipped that fly down an absolute tree. I don't know which fly it's on. Oh, it's on the middle dropper. Get out that weed. It's the problem we've got here is the weed beds. The Carixa and the buzzers are all feeding uh, all living around the weed beds rather and the trout are coming in for them but shallow water and weed keep over there it's better oh, whoops it's got some weed on him yeah brilliant there we go oh lovely rainbow cracking condition Bright red bits, middle dropper, right in the scissors. Right, what we ought to do now is spoon that fish, just to make sure what we're doing is right, that they are feeding on the buzzers. Oh, there's our fish. I've just dispatched. Take the red bits out of its mouth. It's another handy thing to always have upon you. A pair of forceps. Makes it much easier to take the hook out of the fish's mouth. There we are. Let's get that out of the way. Right. Now then, let's give it a spoon and see what it's been feeding on. You can see by the state of my marrow spoon it gets an awful lot of use. So let's open its mouth up, put the spoon in, give it a good twist and see what it's on. Whoa, look at that. Proof for the pudding. More of that one on me than one in my hand. There's a mixed diet there. This just proves what opportunistic feeders trout are. There's a couple of feathers there, so it probably would have taken those off the top. It's got a live bloodworm in it, and as you, you can see there, there is a live 
green buzzard pupa wriggling around beautifully there. Another one there. Empty buzzer shucks as well. There, I'm just pulling it out now with the end of the spoon. That's an empty buzzer shuck. That's where this a buzzer pupa like that has actually hatched, broken through that pupil shuck, as they call it, and broken through and emerged as an adult fly. And these are left on the surface, and the trout feed on them on the surface. There's not much protein in it, but they take it anyway. Look at that. A few Daphnia as well. And there's a few little bits of legs with that head of a buzzer, so that shows it was a, an adult. Right, let's get rid of all that rubbish off of my hands. Ugh. Flick that away. So these are the flies that I use to catch buzzer feeders. This is my box of buzzer nymphs and this is my box of dries. The buzzer nymphs here are in lots of different colours, lots of different sizes because buzzers, coronamids, are lots of different sizes and colours. So what we tend to do is use buzzer nymphs there to imitate the pupa stage of the coronamid and little floss type buzzers there to imitate the bloodworm stage that normally hang around on the bottom in the mud. So once they come up from the mud through to the middle layers right onto the surface this is when we use dries. So as you can see from these they're mainly bobs bits, um, a few bibio dries, some little cold canards, hares ears and of course hoppers. Um, the fly that I used to catch that fish just now was a bright red bob's bit, it's like that, and these sit right in the surface film. We know that they're actually feeding in the surface because you can see the fish rising, and that's what that fish was doing earlier. So, having shown you the flies that I use to catch when they're taking them off the surface, what I'll do is re-gink my dry fly that I actually caught the fish with just now, and we'll go and see if we can catch another. Here we are. Right, we just put a tiny bit of gink onto your forefinger. Some people advocate actually putting the gink onto the fly itself. That's not a good idea. You end up with far too much gink into the dressing of the fly. The fly hits the water and you get a big oil slick all around it, so don't do that. Put a little bit onto your forefinger, rub it with your thumb. If it comes out of the container like Vaseline and it's solid, just blow on it, rub it with your thumb and your body heat will melt it. Once you've done that, all you do is that and that fly is ginked up. I won't bother doing the other two because they've been ginked already. So once you've ginked up, the other thing to do, especially when you've been catching hold of the leader for a while, is to degrease. This is my pot of degreasing agent. It's homemade, all it is, is full as earth and washing up liquid. Mix it together into a, a sticky paste and then, if I can find my leader, just rub it down through the entire leader just once like that. Take it right down through the droppers, right to the fly. Don't worry if you get a bit on the fly. The gink's so good it'll uh, counter that. And take it right down through like that. There we are. So we've ginked the flies up and that's the floatant and we've put the degreasing agent, the sinkant, onto the leader. And now we're ready to go and catch another fish. Right, we're back out in the water again. It's been such a changeable day and such a changeable couple of days, in fact. Already today we've had a, an easterly wind, a southeasterly wind, a little period of flat calm. We've now got a southwesterly, so it's getting a bit brighter. I'm going to put my glasses on, not just for the brightness, but also to protect my eyes from the flies here, because I'm going to be casting over my right shoulder. Right. Still got my team of dries on. But one of the things about fishing dries, and in fact fishing any type of patterns, is good presentation. What I'm going to concentrate on now 
it's just showing you how you can turn the flies over. That's one way. And if you didn't spot that, what you do is you actually cast a little bit further than you've got line off of the reel. So the flies shoot out in the air with the fly line, turn over in the air like that and drop down nice and softly on the water and they turn over one, two, three. If they don't turn over in a straight line, you won't get good positive takes, you'll get swirls. So it's really important to get those flies to turn over. If you're fishing pulling flies like nymphs or even an intermediate or a sinking line, it's just as important to turn those flies over because when those flies land in a straight line, as soon as you start retrieving, you're in contact with the flies. If you've got a big loop of line and your flies have landed like that and maybe even back on themselves, you can pull about three or four times before you're even moving the flies. So if something takes you on the drop, you'll never know about it. So we just go through that little bit again. Casting out, a couple of false casts, up to the horizon, line hits the back of the reel, flies turn over and land softly. Another way of getting the flies to land straight is a much easier way. It involves my left hand here. As I shoot the line, I just stop it like that. So shoot your line, let the line run through your hand, feather it slightly, but at the critical moment, just trap it with your thumb. Once again, it's lift off, up, shoot the line, stop it. And the flies land, bump, 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 in a straight line, and you're fishing again. Although buzzers are absolutely prolific here at Blagden, there's plenty more food in the margins. What I'll do is I'll just scoop up a chunk of weed and we'll go and have a look and see what's actually in there. Here's a big chunk. Whoa! Probably going to break my net. Just to show the diversity of all the food stuff here, just in the margins, in one big scoop of weed, Plus a couple of little land drains I picked up on the way out. Look at all the food that's here for the trout to feed on. Most of the things that are in this little container here will be eaten by trout. If we can have a closer look, you can actually see all the bits and pieces that are in here. Right, there's a caddis, a case caddis. You can see it actually walking along the bottom there. Little legs. Next to the case caddis is a hog louse. There we are, trundling along hog louse. Now, a very similar thing to a hog louse, and people confuse them with hog louse, are shrimps. Here in the corner are two, sh three shrimps. There we are. Look how they move. Totally different, almost on their sides. Very mobile, very active. Talking about things that aren't active, there's a snail. Here's one. Here's another one. But trout eat snails and they really crunch on them. If we look down here on the bottom again, there's a blood worm. There we are. And the blood worm is the larva of the buzzer. There it goes. Then in here, somewhere, here we are. There is the buzzer pupa, just there. So that's pupated from the blood worm into that little buzzer pupa. So it's quite active. There it goes, back down to the bottom again. Corixa, there's lots of Corixa in here. Here's a Corixa, just there. They're known as water boatmen. They're actually the lesser water boatmen. The greater water boatmen is much, much bigger than that, about four times the size. There's also a pond olive in here. In fact, there's two pond olives just down here. Try and get one of those there. They've just darted off. There it goes. There it goes again. There it is. Up here. That little thing. That's a pond olive. And last but not least, the stickleback. There it is. Little fish. So it's a fantastic amount of food for the fish. All these little shells here are all the cases made by um, caddis. And caddis are the uh, 
the insects that hatch into sedges. So when you see sedges skittering about on the surface at night, they've always come from these little cases. And they construct these little cases, live on the bottom, until it's time for them to crawl out, literally, of the case, come to the surface and hatch. So this is the food that's here for the fish. Let's have a look at some of the flies we use to represent these uh, insects. There's a shrimp, nice little shrimp pattern, and a crixa pattern, pond olive pattern. Most of these are larger than life, but a general representation is probably a lot better than close copy. Another caddis, hair's ear version of a caddis, another caddis, different shrimps. And of course gold heads, which don't really represent anything, but the gold head helps them get right down and sink through to the bottom. There's nothing that a gold head actually um, looks like. A gold head just makes it plop down through the water and get down to the bottom. But when you're fishing nymphs, quite often you want a sacrificial nymph or a nymph that's just going to get straight down through to the bottom. You fish two droppers with it, cast it across the wind and just let it swing around. And that's a great way of catching fish and probably I would imagine over 50% of all fish caught on reservoirs from the bank on still waters are caught on a free drifted nymph with a leaded fly on the point and allowed to swing around on the breeze. And I think we'll have a go at that in a minute because we've got a nice little ripple coming up and we'll go and catch a few fish on nymphs. Well, it's really warmed up now, so much so, I've had to take my sweatshirt off. So. Looking at the weather conditions, we've got pretty bright skies, but a bit of cloud coming over, very flat calm. The fish that were moving close in have moved further out, so these are perfect conditions to try the nymph. I've got a gold head on the point and a couple of nymphs on the droppers, so let's pair a bit of line out and experiment with the different depth. a short cast to start off with. Give it a pull to straighten it all up and let it sink a bit. What I'm going to do first of all is I'm going to let that gold head just go down a little way and figure of eight it very very slowly back so that the point fly should get down about one or two feet but the two droppers will be subsurfaced by about six inches or so. My cast is about 13-14 feet long. Gold head on the point and then two droppers which are unleaded. I bring it fairly close in, smooth lift of the rod, just in case something's following. No, nothing there. Slightly longer cast. Hold it all back to get it to turn over. Now it's strange, as soon as that bit of cloud cover, cover has come over, we've got a bit of ripple coming up from the southwest. So that will give us a bit of ripple and enough to be able to cast out and let the line form a lovely bow and that will let the flies actually swing round and almost fish themselves so this will be a good chance of getting the fish that ripples nearly with me it's a lovely slow type of fishing I think this is synonymous with nymphing. You can fish your nymphs as fast as you like. Bit of a tangle there. Well, there's that tangle un undone. Tangles are an everyday bit of fly fishing. And we all get tangles. And a lot of people say to me, I couldn't go fishing, I haven't got the patience. Well, when I'm actually fishing, you don't need any patience whatsoever. There's always something going on. The only time you do need a little bit of patience is when you're undoing tangles. The secret with tangles is never to pull them. Just take a bit of time and they usually come undone. If they're too bad, just cut the line, break your leader off and tie a new one.
I'm sure that was a little knock then, just as it swung round. Got a little bit of ripple now coming from right to left over my right shoulder. Beautiful conditions for swinging a nymph round. The point fly will actually act as an anchor now. It will anchor it all up while the two nymphs fish above it. It's pulled into a little bit of weed, so that means that the point fly is getting right down, so that's where I want it to be. Just take this bit of weed off. There's actually a method very similar to this called the sacri sacrificial nymph method. And what you do is you fish a heavily weighted nymph or lure on the point and you cut the point of the hook off. It's better cast. Straighten it up. What happens then is you let that sink right to the bottom over weedy water. This is fairly weedy, but not as bad as sometimes. And you let that go right to the bottom and fish two nymphs above it, or two wet flies perhaps, like a mallard and claret or a silver and victor. And you let that barbless, pointless hook trundle through the weed while you rely on the fish taking the flies above it. But in these conditions, we don't need to fish a sacrificial nymph. Swinging around beautifully on a bow there. I love this type of fishing. Let's just speed it up. As it starts to form a nice big bow, I just speed it up a bit just to swing the nymphs around. Just fish the flies out. Nothing there. Right, this cast I'm going to really, really slowly fish it back. I know this fish out there. I've caught a few. I've bumped a few. I've seen lots. Now I'm just waiting to swing my nymphs around. Swinging it. Yes! Classic. Classic on the nymph. Oh yes. Staying deep. There he is. He's on the point as well. It's on that gold head. I'll watch those weeds. I've had enough trouble with the weeds today. Keep that rod up. There he is. I think it could be a brown. Yeah, it probably is. Rainbow's normally jumping by now. And it's got a bit of weed on him as well. Yeah, definitely a brownie. Yep. Bit of weed, it pacifies him completely. Let's take my chance and... Yes! That's great. Now, as it's a brown... I'm just going to wet my hands. Try and release it. As gently as possible. That, just that bit of weed quietens them off like that. Look, it's got a cormorant mark. It's mending, but it's got a cormorant mark. That's the telltale stab marks. The gold head in the mouth. There's the hook out. We're just putting back to give somebody else some pleasure. And I'm just going to hold it for a little while and cradle it. Just push it forward a little bit. Try and get some oxygen. Some water through its gills. That's better. Just hold it for a while until it's ready. As soon as it's ready, I'll know. It'll start to kick away. Girls are working well. There it is. And off she goes. Beautiful. It's a lovely catching fish, but it's also lovely putting them back as well. And I like putting browns back. 
smashing. Well, that was great catching that brownie. It's fairly typical behaviour, really, of brown trout to feed quite deep. So, seeing it took the gold head, which was probably trundling on or very close to the bottom, we've now got lovely cloud. So, I thought, well, let's try an unleaded nymph on the point, in this case, a DL Bach nymph. Still got a couple of buzzers on. Let's get rid of that bit of weed on my dropper. And we'll try swinging the flies around near the. Ah, there's a fish moved out there. That's what we want to see. While it was fairly bright, the fish weren't going to move, but now there's one fish moved. Where there's one, there should be a few more. So, see if we can get a fish on unleaded nymph tactics. Takes a while to work the line out when it's all shoved around the net there. Right. With these methods, you can let it go as slowly as you really want to because there's no leaded nymph to get down and hook amongst the weed. Almost the same as fishing dries, but with dries, you're covering a lot more water because you're casting more regularly. Now you're just dropping the flies out decent distance and just swinging them around on the breeze. If ever I'm bank fishing, one of the important things to look for is a breeze going left to right or right to left. We've got a lovely right to left breeze at the moment. Let's give it a pull to tighten it all up. These are pretty good conditions now. There's another fish moved out there, outside of my casting range, but that's encouraging. Swing around beautifully on the bow. I quite like fishing leaded nymphs and letting them trundle round, but fishing unleaded nymphs and you know that they're just tripping around, around on the breeze all the way in close and tight to the shoreline. Because although you can't see them, the fish are quite often only sort of 10 foot away from you. You try and cast long distances, but you must always finish your cast quite close. And always bring the flies in so you can see them before lifting off. good distance. And what I do now is I just wait for a second, figure of eighting very, very slowly, just to keep in touch, in case I've got to take straight away. Sometimes you do, you give it a pull to straighten it all up and there's a fish there. Now the wind is starting to affect it and it's just starting to put that lovely bow into the line. Oh, there's a fish just jumped right out the water there. Incidentally, fish that jump clear of the water are very, very rarely feeding fish. They're normally stressed for one reason or another. Oh, that was a knock. That was a knock. That was a definite knock. Yes, yes. That was a cracker. I thought I had a knock there. That's brilliant. Well, that's going well, too. Crikey. That's a cracking fish. Whoop. Now it's taking me onto the reel. He's going out again. Just adjust this drag. He's still trying to get away. <laughs> trying to get around those beds. I do prefer playing fish on the reel. Good running fish if I can. I once got my finger jammed on the reel handle as it went round, so I always keep it well away from now on. Just adjust the drag again. That's it, that's better. He's on the top dropper. Ah, that's a green buzzer. 
Now, Blagdon's famous for its Blagdon Green Midge. If I can keep his head up. No, it doesn't. I thought he was ready then. Ah, oh, yeah, it is. Just about. It's this last desperate lunge where they quite often come off. That's it. Let's try and get it. Yeah, oh, great. Brilliant. That was lovely fish, that was. That's a nice fish too. Right, let's go back ashore. Wow. Having just dispatched that fish, we'll get the old marrow spoon out again. See what this has been feeding on. And the hooks come away in the net as well. Well, there's not very much in. Ah, there is something interesting though. It's got a stickleback in it, as well as a shrimp, a buzzer, and a bloodworm, and another buzzer. <laughs> Talk about opportunistic. Having seen that stickleback in the spoonings of that fish, I think what we'll do now is we'll have a look at the lures that I use and the fry imitating patterns that most of us use on these reservoirs. So I think I'll just get rid of that and go up and have a look at some flies. These are my lure boxes. I've got four boxes of lures ranging from competition style flies, which are maximum size 15 sixteenths of an inch long on 5 eighths of an inch hooks and that's this box here right through to pretty big gold head marabou laws all of them serve different purposes these are a complete mix match of all sorts of different types of laws there's boobies here there's doubles there's orange laws, there's all sorts of attractors in amongst that box. So that's one box that you could do almost anything with. Then you get flies like this that are floating fry patterns, different types of boobies and razzlers, more floating fry. These are just big nymphs really there. This is quite a ghastly looking box full of all sorts of unmentionables but all of which work, especially from the bank, especially early season. It's all very well fishing nymphs and having a lovely time fishing imitative flies, but when it's freezing cold day in the end of March or April, there's no way those flies are going to catch fish. You can fish away for hours without a touch, put on something like a little black gold head like that, and you're into a fish versus a second cast. Trout really respond to anything that comes into their territory, and they're very aggressive by nature, so they chase these things and actually have a go at them. These are quite a modern conception, really, gold heads. When I think of a gold head, I think of a lovely little hair's ear with a tiny little gold bead on the end. This isn't quite the same sort of thing. But once that marabou is wet, that actually thins down. And when it's moving through the water, the gold head will force the fly to go down, the tail will go behind it, and then you actually pull the line and pull it up, and so it fishes like that, and it's absolutely irresistible to trout at times. But what we're going to do now is fish for a few of these stickleback feeders, and I think something small and white, something like a small mini appetizer like this would be a good idea. And if we can't get anything on that, we might even go over to a larger appetizer, if they want a bigger mouthful, or even over to something like a big marabou cat's whisker. So let's go and catch some fish, hopefully, on an intermediate line and some fry patterns. Right, I'm all set up with a team of fry patterns to try and catch some of these stickleback feeders. So I've got an appetizer on the point, quite a large one. I've got a, a pearly thorax pheasant tail in the middle and I've got a very small appetizer, mini appetizer on the top dropper. I've got an intermediate line on, <coughs> excuse me, and one of the things I will do, because I'm fishing an intermediate and it means when I've cast out and retrieved my line, 
the line's naturally going to sink in coils at my feet. If there's any weed or any rubbish on the bottom there, the line gets caught up and you can't shoot your line when you're casting again. So what we tend to do in this situation is use the landing net in a different way. And just push the net into the water like that at an angle. There we are. Let's see if it'll stay like that. And wrap the net around a little bit and then we retrieve the line actually into the net. Let's get a bit of line off. So let's see if we can catch one of these stickleback feeders. Wind is still not too bad, but it's, it could be a little bit better. It's awkward for casting over your right shoulder for a right-hander here. So there we are. There's the line dropping into the tray. Because it's quite shallow and there's a fair bit of weed, I'm going to retrieve these flies pretty quickly. Because if you've ever seen sticklebacks move around, or roach fry or perch fry, they go pretty quickly. So I'm trying to pull the fish to the fly. More line, I think. The great thing about fishing fry patterns at a speed like this is when a trout does get hold of the fly, it really hits it with a wallop, and you've got absolutely no doubt at all that they've taken the fly. The other side of the coin, mind, is that there's a lot of casting involved. A lot of effort, 